Let's get close, but not so close. For a time, you can share from a distance. For a time, you know we want to see each other. You'll have to stay in your quarantine space while we talk. <laughs> We turned 25 today. This is the 25th episode of Quarantine. Welcome. I'm Peter Hirschberg. And this show, and in fact, the next couple of weeks of show, is really about putting things back together. Uh, how do cities recover? What do we do when small business has been so suppressed by all of this to, to bring things back? Uh, what, what are the techniques? What are the forms of urbanism that work and the forms of urbanism that we have to change because we'll be in a period of social distancing. This this becomes the fascinating meat of building our our world of tomorrow and our society. So today we're focusing on on how we build neighborhoods and how we build small business. And there's just gonna be a lot of exciting stuff here. Um, uh, many of you know that uh, at Maker City, we were working a lot on economic development and opportunity zones and in fact wrote a book on maker cities. So today we're going to turn to our friends at Coplace in San Diego that have found ways of, of building up uh, economic developments and, and businesses in challenged parts of town quickly and inexpensively, kind of a leaner platform and a faster way to get to small business that both creates more of an ownership economy, more entrepreneurs. And it turns out that's a very good idea when suddenly the national program is to bring small business back. And then um, also joining us is uh, Jesse Leon, who comes from an amazing background, having come from the Barrio, gone through Harvard, gone off to the banking world, and now working in economic development. Uh, that gives us a sense for the energy that things will take. Mm -hmm. Then we'll come back to San Francisco, and we'll talk to uh, Ragben Okabio, who is with the uh, Department of Planning. Uh, how, how do our streets both drive for civic engagement and business and economic development? And we'll show you some really interesting projects. And then a special treat. Um, if you've been following the news, you know something was going on in Seattle. Um, uh, there was a portion of town that was declared to be on an autonomous zone. And uh, if, you, if, if you watched right-wing television, then you knew for sure that uh, it had been taken over that uh, that there were warlords in charge uh, and it had been given up. Or perhaps this was civil discourse and protest at its best. I got so uh, curious about all of this that um, uh, we had Mickey's son, Zen, go to Seattle. Well, he lives in Seattle. Go to that place, spent a few hours last night, and today we have his report to find out what's really going on there. Mickey, uh, welcome. Uh, here's my co-host, Mickey uh, uh, McManus. Hi there. Hey, Peter, um, how you been? Thank you for making your son available to go to what might have been a war zone, but is a democracy up there in Seattle. Well, you know, he uh, earlier in his career uh, lived in D.C. and was on the um, on the commission looking into wartime contracting for Iraq and Afghanistan, sort of modeled on the Truman Commission. So he was working for a congressional commission. And actually, we only found out as his family that he had actually deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq to go with the um, uh, with the Secretary of State and the, and the crew of uh, auditors. Um, and we only found out afterwards that he had actually deployed there uh, to really understand what was going on. And of course, we heard about uh, uh, some pretty pretty dangerous things going on uh, at the height of some of the conflict. Um, and so uh, occasionally Zen surprises me, but he usually doesn't tell me until after it's happened, which makes me feel better. Well, you, you uh, introduced so. me to him yesterday, <laughs> and we had fun as he went and was reporting in, so we'll get to that a little bit later. Let's begin uh, with uh, Jesse Leon. Uh, welcome to these microphones, Jesse. <laughs> Thank you, Peter and Mickey, for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with the two of you. Hey, Jesse. Uh, you have an amazing story and background that leads you to, I think, a 360-degree perspective 
on how we bring back challenged neighborhoods. This was, of course, important before all of this happened, but in a way we've gone backwards because uh, so many small businesses kind of went on hold for a few months and their economics are challenged because mm -hmm. of restaurants and things like that. Um, walk us through a little bit about where you grew up and how you've now come to be doing economic development in San Diego, because I think that that becomes a lesson for what people need to think about and also the challenges that challenged communities face. Oh, definitely, Peter. Thank you uh, for that introduction. So born and raised here in San Diego in the barrio, uh, Mexican family, Mexican immigrant family. I was that sweet, smart, nerdy kid. I had my hair parted to the side, my welfare glasses, which are super thick at a time when thick, trendy, hipster looking glasses were not trendy. And um, I, after being, after a few severely traumatic experiences and being bullied a lot, I rebelled. And for me, being smart meant being weak. And being weak meant that I would fall prey uh, to you and other people out in the community. So at 14, I turned to streets, uh, turned to the street life and the gang life and was hooked on drugs. And so, I exposed my family to some major traumatic experiences. And to make the long story short, at 18, I was homeless, sleeping in a park here in San Diego called Balboa Park. Um, a sex worker uh, weighed 135 pounds and strung out on crystal meth and heroin and doing anything and everything to support my habit. And so at 18, I got clean and sober. And with the support of my mom and the support of the community and people that believed in me, I went to community college and it took me four years to get my associate's degree. Uh, one of those years was beauty school, so I did cosmetology. And then I transferred on to UC Berkeley and uh, was able to organize the first conference on prison industry with Angela Davis and a few other community leaders where she coined the term prison industrial complex with an organization called Critical Resistance. And so, Luckily, was able to study abroad. I lived in Spain for a year, and I came back from Spain, and I went to go do HIV research in Havana, Cuba. And then after that, I got a pretty much a full ride to Harvard. So I got my master's degree from Harvard University. And after Harvard, I started my life in uh, public finance. I went to Wall Street for a little while. And um, started getting involved. When I left Wall Street, my former partner and I moved to Miami and I started working in the field of philanthropy and urban redevelopment. And that's where my frustrations around how monies are being funneled into economic development and urban revitalization um, started to frustrate me because I, I, I saw the good work that philanthropy was doing. I saw the good work that our nonprofits are doing on the ground but there seemed to be a major disconnect on how the resources are getting on the ground to some of the communities that need it. And so I didn't understand the numbers. Um, I, so my mentors, Darren Walker from the Ford Foundation, Miguel Garcia at the time, and a few other people encouraged me to apply to UPenn. So I did a postgraduate fellowship at UPenn with the Center for Urban Redevelopment Excellence and lived, lived on campus and <laughs> slept, breathed in urban real estate development nonstop. And so I learned how to run pro formas and, and become a developer. So I went to Bank of America. So I worked for Bank of America CDC for about five years. And many people don't know this, but Bank of America has a real estate development company inside the bank that builds affordable housing. It's one of the largest real estate developers in the country. And so while at Bank of America, under the leadership of some amazing people that took me under their wing, I was able to build about 5,000 units of mixed income affordable housing and a few major master development projects. Uh, two of note are the Encore in Tampa, Florida, which is a 28.8 acre master development site between downtown Tampa and Ybor City. And the other is Creative Village, uh, Creative Village, which is in Orlando in the Paramore District. And so, after doing that for about five years, I was asked uh, to come on board and manage the foundation for JP Morgan, Chase for the state of Florida, manage that foundation for a while, and then did about three years at HUD, worked on a choice neighborhoods team at HUD where I was managing about 170 million in grants to cities across the country to revitalize urban areas. 
And uh, most recently, prior to COVID, relocated back home to be closer to my 80 year old mom and learned about the stuff that Coldplace was doing. I had been interviewing. Jesse, you have a, I have a, I have a question. Ahead. You you mentioned that um, you went into banking and became disappointed with resource allocation and the way that economic redevelopment was being done. Um, what were those frustrations? And then kind of bring us forward to today. What are the things that you see not working or that we most need to be aware of uh, that, that you want to see change? The My frustrations were that A lot of the resources continue to go to the usual suspects, uh, organizations that have the marketing capacity, uh, that have the capacity to to get the attention of the leaders within the banking system or even mm -hmm. philanthropy. And so there's organizations on the ground that are doing really, really good work. Um, here in San Diego, there's a number of nonprofits that have um, approached Coplace, have approached me and said, hey, you know that we, 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 we lease space in a building here in the barrio and we're in an opportunity zone and the developers have been approaching the owner of the building and said, Hey, we're going to offer you two and a half, two and a half million. Uh, they've been in this building for 20 plus years and they don't want to be displaced. So the owner has actually said, we'll sell it to you for a million and five, uh, or I'll even carry the debt. If you're able to find, you know, if you can provide 35% down in equity for us to be able to, to stay within the building. And what happens is that there, is, there aren't those kinds of resources uh, for individuals that may be struggling with that access to capital. So, so Jesse, I, I want to stop you there. Um, so uh, this, I, I just want to make sure we're clear on this because I think this is, uh, I, we could probably do like three hours just on your whole journey, by the way, but it's just, it's incredible. <laughs> and and uh, oh my gosh, it's just wonderful to hear you um, describe just the kind of grit that you have um, and, 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 you know, digging yourself out and figuring this stuff out. But it sounds like this big disconnect is that we have the usual suspects getting the money because maybe they're trusted or they're you they're like, oh, they're good at marketing themselves. Maybe they're a nonprofit or whatever. But then the, the resources aren't actually making it to the people that are local, that are there, that actually maybe have some way of doing this. Is that am I getting that right? Partly so. Uh, what okay. ends up happening that, that I'm seeing is there is no rapid deployment of capital. So uh, I'm a nonprofit or I'm even a, say, for example, I'm a private developer and I want to do some really good things here in the barrio and I care about the community. I believe in quadruple bottom line strategies, mm -hmm. cultural returns, economic returns, environmental returns and, and economic returns. So environment, yeah. ec environment economics, um, equity, culture. And I can go to the intermediaries to provide some resources. However, the timing to one, the interest rates aren't always as competitive. They can be anywhere between six to 9% um, interest rates for, for lending. The other is the timing. So if I need rapid turnaround time to acquire a building where a developer has already stepped in to ask that owner um, to purchase the land and the landowner really wants to sell quickly to the highest bidder. Um, but I have to wait at least anywhere between two to three months for the approval process within various intermediaries for the financing to hit the ground for me to get approved. That's if I get approved. And so there are no alternative resources other than me going to a hard money lender, which I'm not knocking hard money lenders. I think they, 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 uh, they, they service a need. However, the interest rates can be more competitive. So the faster response that I need, the more expensive they're going to be. This sounds like an instance, and, and we saw this uh, in, in some of the COVID response, that basically large companies have lots of access to cheap capital, uh, whereas people who are trying to, who are you know excellent business people, but they're smaller and they don't have that balance sheet, don't, which means the system kind of continues to favor what larger companies or franchises would do, and then it leaves a lot of other good work out just because it's slower or doesn't have access to the capital, which exactly. is kind of a shame when there's a lot of effort out there that could make a big difference. Uh, is, is it also true, though, that these these areas might be blighted or they might have really tough area problems, but there are people locally who actually have ideas for how to how to do something, you know, to, to, to bring things to the table, but they don't have the resources. They don't have the quick deployment of capital. Is that what's going on as well? 
that is what's going on. And so, mm. uh, you know, the barrio here, Logan Heights, and in our area, we had a 6% unemployment rate about a year ago around this time. And around April 18th or April 28th, the report came out that the unemployment rate in, in Logan Heights went up to 38% post COVID. And the same thing can be said in Baltimore, it can be said in Atlanta, that a lot of our communities, even though some resources may have been available for small businesses, I don't know if it's really getting to the families or individuals uh, that need those resources to be sustainable over time. So when I saw what Cold Place was doing, and I saw that uh, what they were attempting to do in the community, what they have done with some of the small businesses um, and the social impact they've been having in my community, I thought, wow, this is something I definitely got to uh, become a part of and get behind and figure out ways to get the resources so that our communities are not displaced. Let's bring uh, Mark Berkowitz in from Cold Place because, Mark, you are a... Uh you're an entrepreneur, you're a real estate developer, but kind of what you've hit on is a rapid prototyping, leaner, faster way for people who have an idea for a business to have one and to get that business in a challenged part of town to drive customers there. So give us a sense for what Coplace and, is. And, and to connect this, connect this all. Yeah. So Jesse, now you're working with Mark at, at Coplace. Um, you came back for your mom and now you're kind of saying, how do we actually give fuel to this? How do we rethink about this, this kind of stuff? So I just, I want to make the connection for the viewers that, that there's something related here. And you, well, Jesse, I'm, exploring, yeah. I'm exploring the opportunities in working with Mark and the team. So Perfect. I've agreed to, uh, to work with them side by side because when I met them and I met with Sasha and I went to the neighborhood, I went to the same barrio that I used to hang out in the oh, same barrio wow. that I would be selling drugs in and, and met with some of the business owners and met with some of the Latino people that mm. live there, that work there. They know the guys. And so there oh, was a sense okay. of camaraderie and a sense mm -hmm. of, I'm not sure if you've ever seen Hentified um, on, on Netflix, mm -hmm. but the real life challenges that a lot of our Latino and black communities across mm -hmm. the country are facing. And sometimes we feel alone. We feel we have no help in this situation. And so I saw what the guys were doing in the neighborhood and thought, wow, this is something I could definitely figure out a way to bring some resources into the into the community, more than what's already being done. I'm not criticizing yeah. philanthropy. Mark, Mark, tell us the story, uh, going back to Logan and some of the first projects you did, of why it is you went to a part of town that was basically disregarded in gangland and then turned that into a thriving kind of small business hub that brought customers in from the rest of town. Well, first off, thanks guys for having me. Um, <clears throat> hey, Peter and, and Mickey, good to see you. And uh, Jesse, always wonderful to see you. And and hopefully you all know that uh, I'm reasonably intelligent because the moment I met Jesse, I decided we had to snatch him up. So <laughs> if I've done something right, it's that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, um, really how Coplay started is that um, in San Diego, um, where we do a lot of our projects, uh, you know, there was, there was a movement of, of gentrification happening and we could see you know, looking long term that there was, um, you know, a lot of good things that were going to be happening over in the Barrio Logan neighborhood and in um, Logan Heights areas in general. And since we take a longer outlook, we were, you know, looking to come in there early and, you know, come into specifically an area where there weren't really, you know, comparable sales and things like that. So we could get much better value um, on our acquisition price. And that, you know, really was the, the basis of, of why we started doing our projects, right? We're real estate developers and investors and lenders and things like that. So we went into this with, you know, an economically focused position. And, you know, a lot of times when I have chats with folks, I like to remind them that we're not, you know, social impact and we're not, um, you know, philanthropy, that, that we definitely are, are folks looking out there. And, and that's why our projects tend to be successful is because we focus on the economics of it. And then you know, blighted areas and distressed communities, um, the, the way that you generate a positive return for yourself as an investor is by investing in the people. And that's, um, sounds relatively simple, but um, to really have a holistic approach to, you know, not just doing what our projects um, are designed to do economically, but we focus on, on what we call positive externalities, this idea that when our project comes into a neighborhood, it creates value in the dirt that sits under that entire neighborhood thus ensuring us a nice return, but at the same time, you know, creating equity in the community. And then we focus on 
uh, filling our spaces with local community businesses. We, we bring them through a relatively loose but but, but well thought through um, incubation process, right? So, you know, they can start out with uh, a small like daily commitment at our pop-up shops. Um, and if they are successful there, then we'll offer them a small space in maybe one of our containers or micro retail spots, you know, somewhere around a hundred square feet, you know, really, really, really low barrier to entry for the, the, the entrepreneur to come test um, that great idea to see if it's viable economically and, and within the marketplace. Um, and then, you know, from there, if they're successful in a, in, a, in a smaller micro space, we'll bring them up into a slightly larger space, you know, maybe 300 square feet or something like that, uh, with the goal to be not them staying inside of our projects, but but to move them out into the main street and the surrounding area. Because again, um, us as, as the initial catalyst of, of all of this work, um, that has a positive impact for us economically, right? Um, but ultimately it's what's best for the neighborhood is to help bring these, these these businesses out to the main street and create a more thriving, uh, resilient I wanna, community. So what I find fascinating about this is, uh, th this is when we think of incubation, we usually think of some tech startup that goes to an incubator and a VC funds it and then something happens. Now this, th this is more like how you'd bring a restaurant along or a small craft thing along. When they start, someone has an idea in a community because they cook, right? They like to cook pork or whatever they do at home. So they start sure. off with a pop-up stand, which is what, maybe a hundred bucks a day, but there's not, there's no long-term commitment. They show up and they try their hand at something. And then eventually they move into a little piece of a shipping container, but there's not a lot of fixed cost. And so mm -hmm. in this thing, they're not, they're, they're graduating up what they're doing, but then there's also a training component. And of it course, sounds like there's a component too, where they're, they're in a critical mass. This, uh, the positive externality you talked about, Mark, is you create a critical mass where they can learn from each other. Um, they, can, yeah, they can learn from the other people. So yeah, take us through a little bit more of that because I think that's powerful. It's just this notion of, I, you know, I think you mentioned this last time we talked, here's this blighted area of land. Here are these people who actually spend money, but they, they can't find a local laundromat or they can't find a local whatever. And you're like, look, they're like actually pretty close. If we create something here, we'll bring in money and we'll bring in the locals that can actually do things. Am I getting that right? Uh, Absol absolutely, Mickey. And so I'll kind of hit on two two points. One, I'll give an example of, of a real project, which is mm -hmm. is pertinent because Peter's, I think, going to show a, a clip at some point that, that actually is the building I'm going to discuss. Um, but just generally speaking, uh, we have a, a, a it sounds again, we, we try to keep things pretty simple. We have a three pronged approach to how we look at projects, right? So there's there's a, a data driven component to what we're doing. And that gets into that idea, you know, Mickey, that we talked about last time, which is, you know, that helps us figure out what does a neighborhood need? And we don't look at just standard um, um, data sets that you would look at typically in, as a real estate developer. We're looking at all kinds of things that range from, you know, Yelp activity to mobile device behavior. Uh, search engine um, analysis as to what are people searching for or not searching for, uh, what kind of uses and what kind of activities are getting, you know, social media based sentiment. And then we, you know, cross reference that stuff against demographics and psychographics and, you know, traffic count and a variety of other factors. And that helps us really de decipher what a neighborhood needs. Um, then we go, you know, boots on the ground and we, and we ask people what they want um, because what people, what a neighborhood needs and what it wants is, is a lot of times not necessarily going to perfectly align. Um, and then we just, you know, make sure that we're within the civic priorities of, of uh, you know, the various agencies and bodies that are um, doing the long term planning of the area. And that tends to be a, a really successful uh, path. Um, you know, a good example of this critical mass is that you know, we came into Barrio Logan, we, we, we bought a building, you know, it was essentially a, a small cap commercial deal, one or two t commercial tenants with a, a few illegal apartments in the back. Now we have, you know, 14 tenants in there all in very small micro spaces. So if you come to the Porvita coffee shop uh, in the front, you can also be a patron of 13 other entrepreneurs just right, right in that mm -hmm. same space. Um, and it allows for a very synergistic, you know, kind of a pop up feel within, you know, an, enc an enclosed space. And then so what, what's what's ended up happening over in Barrio Logan, as an example, is is we've had positive externalities. Yes, on the on the, the value. But in addition, um, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll talk about these things and I'll, I'll, I'll talk in front of, you know, institutional investors or whatnot. And the question I always get is, you know, aren't you worried people are going to copy you? And I'm like, no, I want you to. And if we can be of any assistance, we'd love to help. Um, but what ends up happening in the neighborhoods where we do these kind of projects is that, that other developers and other investors tend to follow suit. And so what's happened on Logan Avenue, as, as a great example, is 
is it's beautiful to see that a lot of these other small cap commercials owned not by us, although we own several properties on the street and across the blocks there, you know, a lot of other owners have come in and taken this micro retail approach. Um, and what's really interesting is through our pop-ups, we've been able to incubate about 80% uh, of the tenants that are uh, in the micro retail spaces in all of, you know, imagine you, you're walking up it, it, and you know, there's a storefront, you would see it's typically one tenant in their one shop, but then you walk in the doors and it's almost like a mini mall. There's like mm. 10, 15, 20 tenants in one small space. You can, you can go to all of them. You can go to one of them. And there's a lot more liveliness. And also that's very helpful for the entrepreneurs because each of those entrepreneurs, even if it's, it's a very small amount, they're marketing their business. So that marketing of that business kind of creates this 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 hive effect, if you will, whereby you know the artist who has the space, you know, three doors down, has a has a client come in uh, to buy their art, and then wouldn't you know it, they want to buy the earrings, or they want to check out, you know, the um, interior design stuff, or you know, they want to pick up some cool sauces to make with with food and, and things like that, and it creates this this really synergistic uh, environment. And to use Logan Avenue as a as a great example, you know, a place where Jesse described that. You know, he was gangbanging and selling drugs. You know, in 2011, uh, the History Channel did a um, an episode of their their show Gangland about Logan Avenue and Logan Heights, and they called you know Logan Avenue one of the most dangerous streets in the country. In 2017, the state of California recognized Barrio Logan as the 14th uh, designated arts and cultural district, um, and the Chicano Park right down the street on on at the end of Logan Avenue was designated a federal uh, historical monument. Um, so the change has happened relatively quickly. Um, and, you know, what I can say best is we didn't do any of it. We just provided an opportunity and a catalyst for this neighborhood uh, in a way that most other investors or, and developers just wouldn't have. Um, so we provide mm -hmm. flexibility in space. We provide flexibility in um, duration. We apply, uh, supply, you know, uh, training. If you need access to, you know, legal advice, you need access to accounting advice, you, you're, you're trying to figure out marketing, things like that. We're going to help you grow the the, the, the the best thing we can do for ourselves, we believe, because we go take a holistic approach to the neighborhoods we, we work in. It's not just one thing we're doing, it's many. Um, what I like to like to consider maybe incremental master planning, right? Um, is that, that we really wanna incubate this process of moving from small to larger to larger to larger, because mm. one of the biggest challenges, you know, small businesses are gonna have is that they're, they're not gonna be able to get access to financing, mostly because they don't have the, strong capabilities in, in the application process. And so our whole goal in moving them through this kind of entrepreneurial journey is to move them out on the main street, get them access to, you know, standard, more, more regular capital, either from SBA or, you know, the traditional lenders and create this vibrant downtown, if you will, within these neighborhoods. It makes for a much more resilient place. Um, mm. So because, because what's really interesting here, there's a statistic, you know, we've been hearing a lot of SBA statistics around this COVID stuff and whatnot, but they haven't brought up this one. Um, and it's 89% of GDP is generated by, by businesses with fewer than 20 employees. Now, what's interesting about those kinds of businesses is those businesses tend to hire from the neighborhood, they pay, tend to pay a more living wage, and they tend to provide more meaningful work. And if we create an environment around that, we create a very resilient place that can weather, you know, whether it's um, health crises or economic crises or, or other types of crises, because they can rely more, more closely on each other. Um, and not have to leave their community to get the services that they need. Let's take a look. We have a clip of one of your uh, restaurants. This is a coffee place. And this this is a guy who started as a small entrepreneur. And now he's become kind of a fixture uh, in, in Logan. Uh, yeah. So let's take a look at that. And then we'll talk about it. Sure. Mario Logan has such great history, I think, um, to start off with. I think anything that's done here has to be done right. Um, and, and embracing the culture definitely is um, the main, like the big thing. You know what I mean? You gotta, it has to be authentic. Exactly. It has people to be, will see right through it. Exa especially here. Yes. Yeah, especially <laughs> here. Um, we got, you know, Chicano Park a block away. Um, you know, everyone, you know, has been doing things from the 70s here and for a purpose. You know what I mean? And we felt like if we came into, you know, into this area and we were going to do something, we knew we had to do it right Absolutely. you know so i think that um you know purpose and passion you know whatever you want to call it but yeah i think um that's what you know we were aiming to get just execute it the right way and what what's interesting about this is as people come in and start small and graduate up is this may be particularly important right now perhaps going in reverse in the sense that we now have a number of restaurants uh that may not be able to afford 
the rent that they've been paying, right. and they may have some many months in which they can only have half the tables. This mm. is also true of small business. And, and so um, we may be entering an era where entrepreneurs need less fixed cost and more nimble structures. And there also may be a lot of space that isn't being used because of adapt for use or less office building stuff. So this is this is an interesting moment to think about this form of flexibility as perhaps being a strategic part of the toolkit. And, and Jesse, that must be part of what you're seeing in this COVID moment also. Definitely, definitely. First, I want to say, though, that the the video with Milo, um, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful when you see black and brown people participating in our own economic development, in our own communities. You saw a woman there on her laptop, you know, doing some work. And, and this is a neighborhood that for so many years, a lot of people wouldn't come down on because it was super considered really, really dangerous, right? And so it's just beautiful to see that um, when I was walking in the neighborhood and speaking to people, it was people from back in the day that, that are participating in some of that economic development. My dream and my goal is that the resources are available so that the members of the community can pull their resources together and have access to a accessible and affordable slush fund of money so that they too can become developers of color within the community as well themselves. The problem is, is that that type of financing really isn't available for our own people. Hmm. So let's, first of all, it must have been an amazing trip for you to go to a part of town that you were in a gang in and then found it became a bunch of entrepreneurs building businesses. That that had to be a stunning moment. Well, yeah, it was it was <laughs> it was it was really impactful. And being able to talk to folks from high school that I went to high school with and and, and see what what they were doing, see that every Wednesday prior to COVID, uh, there was a market out in the community where the lowriders would be out and people from everywhere in San Diego would come out to and there would be pop-up markets. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is happening in the lottery right on. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing is making sure that there's participation. In terms of restaurants losing spaces, uh, we've had people knock on our doors here um, to figure out ways how they can participate in some of our pop-up markets. Uh, restaurants that have been losing sales, that haven't been able to or may not be able to keep their doors open much longer. And so, um, you know, as you said, in the model, there's, there's not only is there an opportunity for the small businesses to grow incrementally into a permanent space, but it's also those that have been struggling that may be forced to shut down, to downsize into space that is affordable and wow. space for them to go to. So sort of, it, it works in both directions. It's this ability to kind of, shrink and right size for the moment but also not lose not lose potentially the ownership or the or the 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 kind of investment in their own community you know because it feels like when you said your dream your hope your goals are are helping people go from i've never had a business to i'm trying out something to i actually have been able to do something and and i become a developer and i may be able to actually invest in the next in the next generation of people so that so that we can kind of do that kind of stuff um, I, I remember seeing. Oh, it looks like we've got a little, a little. Uh, well, I was. Uh, this was, I was clicking Facebook, on this, this uh, Evo. Yeah. What I was bringing up from Evo is the the opportunity for business model innovation and trying new ideas right now. Because as we've said all along in this show, out of COVID, things are going to be different. I mean, some things will go back to normal, but things will be different. Clearly, one thing that needs to be different is reducing the cost and the overhead and the ability to go try businesses because we just yeah. move up. up. And they need to change a little bit. So Evo, uh, who's doing work on taking space, uh, she, she writes, great to see the conversation. Her business couldn't get PPP or loans, but we're helping venues flip to new use cases. So mm -hmm. Evo was on with us recently, and there are uh, venues in San Francisco that were, you know, music clubs or crowded bars, and now they're becoming, you know, maybe they're virtual production spaces or they're doing place-based immersive media, but 50 people at a time, right? So this is like finding new things to go do. And Mark, you were finding something new to go do. Then you're taking advantage of opportunities on legislation. And then this stuff hit. And when you and I talked after COVID, it was like, well, th th this can be part of an emerging toolkit, a resilient, anti-fragile toolkit that we can use hmm. now. Hey, before we go too much further than this, Mark, you had there was another video that we had that kind of yeah. gave a sense of the kind of growth 
vision or the approach to this. Can we can we run that one, Peter? Yes. Let Let's take a look at this, and this is a walkthrough walkthrough. I think of a project you're working on. So, I mean, yes. Let's run that and go ahead and narrate this, please, for us, Mark. Okay, so this is over in uh, Logan Heights. It's right across the freeway from from Barrio Logan. And what this is is this is a, a site currently that is 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 just a, a pallet storage place. And what we're doing at this property is it's kind of a three pronged approach of of entertainment, housing, um, food, retail, uh, and office. You can see there there's small offices up stop, up top there that can be very flexible in the size and space, be movable. You see down downstairs there's you know bar area here. Um, a lot of open seating. Uh, there's also grills around back. These are permanent food trucks uh, that are also movable so that we can, you know, change the space pretty quickly um, if we need to have different kinds of events. Uh, we'll have a variety of retail, um, office, um, entertainment. You can see that tall right there on the other side of that is actually a, a rock climbing wall. Um, so we'll have a bouldering gym, which is a, a socially uh, focused bouldering gym to bring uh, actually free climbing to the neighborhood um, and, and finance their business through uh, holding Olympic level competitions. And uh, then we'll have, you know, 21 units of uh, workforce housing on site. And then you can see here, these are some of these really small micro retail spaces. And what's really critical to understand here is, is you notice we're, we're going to have like many, many t tenants here with a variety of different uses. So somebody could come use the, the bouldering gym and then obviously they want to go do stuff over here. They might want to use, you know, we'll have futsal tournaments. Um, and that's, you can see here, futsal is a, is a very uh, fast growing sport. There's these large screens up here, that same space can be used for community movie nights. There's a stage below where we can do live music and other types of entertainment. Um, it's all very movable, uh, very changeable, very quickly. Um, and that allows us for flexibility. You saw back there is a 21 unit apartment building, uh, all made out of shipping containers. It'll be the first one in San Diego. Um, so this is kind of just an overview of what is our catalyst project over in the Logan Heights neighborhood. And there's a kind of an overview of mm. what the design looks like. And, and I, I really like the design. If I understand this X correctly, marks the spot. yeah, the, uh, beautiful stuff. And what if I understand this correctly, the idea is um, there is this legislation. We haven't really talked about it very much, but the opportunity mm. zone legislation, which either can be repurposed by ultra wealth managers and just be used as sort of a a way to hide capital gains and, and basically set it on the side or do things, or uh, it can be actually used by the people in the neighborhood and potentially by developers like you and others to to actually try to reboot neighborhoods. You know, the original intention of that 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 uh, uh, that law that went into effect with the Trump tax law was actually to get trillions of dollars of uh, money that was sitting on the sidelines and put liquidity back into. Uh, zones across America that were picked by the governors. But it, it feels like the point here is that, you know, you'll use shipping containers, you'll use pop-up kind of spaces um, to get the the critical mass based on your data analysis of what people need, what people want, what's opportunity. And then as you're building capacity, that actual real estate becomes more valuable. And if people in that local region have some participation in that value, when like the big UC San Diego or the big you know, medical center or something else comes there and wants to build a massive headquarters on there, all the entrepreneurs can kind of move into the first floor. You can actually pick up all the shipping containers, move them to the next flighted area Absolutely. and kind of like reboot, right? So this is this idea of this almost circular economy for this, but trying to repurpose something that has been a little bit distorted um, across the administrations in terms of how to get how to get capital out there in the world. How um, Jesse, you're making faces, so I want I want to make sure I catch it because I'm naive about this. I'm just trying to like kind of learn about it. Jesse. What do you want to say about this? No, well, the hard part is that the access to capital to do an interim access to capital, yeah, does not exist. And so hmm. I was doing my research, and there's no foundation, philanthropic dollars. I'm not even talking about lenders, the traditional yeah. lenders. Foundations have the ability to take on risk and fund projects that are outside the box thinking. Hmm. However, we and the Ford Foundation just did an amazing report. If you haven't seen it, new, the cover of the New York Times, the foundation is going to take out about a billion dollars of of debt to be able to fund some some pro, some programs because mm. they see the need in the communities. However, no foundations, to my knowledge, are currently funding the acquisition of properties for creative creative interim use strategies in our mm. low income communities across the country. And so if we had access to those dollars, it, we, we'd be able to 
have a property get purchased entitled for a community need for future use so that then when a developer chooses to come in and buy that property, it actually meets a community benefit as opposed to what we're seeing right now with opportunity zone investors coming in and building um, storage facilities. How many more right. storage? Yeah, which do you really want those in your place? Yeah. Right. So this so is that just, notion of there's the philanthropists don't have a pathway to invest in interim use. Is that what you're right. saying? Really? And, I, and, I, I and yeah. And I, I know you Before mentioned that the, you're working on a white paper on this and 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 socializing it a little bit. Uh, <laughs> maybe we'll learn about that later uh, in some future episode. Um, I'm sorry, Peter, go. Well, no. So before COVID, before all of this stuff, uh, there were some, uh, the Kresge Foundation had put some money towards uh, investors that were going to do pro-social things. But you've, you've been actually working on a white paper to come up with some recommendations. So I'd love to, this is an interesting time to put on the table since this is a show about how COVID drives innovation. Uh, and the Opportunity Zone program is one of the largest tax breaks in history. And it, it's famous for not having guardrails, hence, you know, uh, somebody can go build a nice hotel, but maybe not help with the barrio. What are some of the things that you're thinking of proposing to foundations that can be the thread that we should be paying attention to here? The main one is uh, creating social impact funds for acquisition of properties from not just nonprofit, but also for-profit local community developers that don't have access to capital. And there was a comment made in, in, in I believe, the live comments, which, you know, what San Francisco was doing. And I, and, and I believe it's great. However, sometimes in our extremely low income communities, our nonprofits are not considered to have the capacity, quote unquote, by some of the foundations to be able to take on some of this work. So I think it's great that you're funding capacity building, technical assistance to get a nonprofit ready. However, that 12 to 18 month period, you're losing an opportunity to acquire properties when you have high end real estate developers with capital gains to purchase an OZs swooping up those th those properties. So one of the recommendations that I have is one, create social impact funds for acquisition at extremely low interest rates, not to exceed 3%. Um, and those funds could actually be managed uh, by people of color um, or diverse fund managers that foundations could hire to manage the, these portfolios. Uh, we see a lack of uh, diverse fund managers across the country and mm. don't even get me started on the, the lack of diversity on some of the developers that are building in our neighborhoods. But um, funding development entities for rapid acquisition, providing funding for interim use property acquisition and placemaking, exactly what CoPlace is doing. Uh, and, okay. you know, um, th and I love great this. Go ahead, to say, there's Sorry. great precedence for this because after the financial crisis, vultures came in and bought up a lot of the housing stock. And right. they were, you know, big hedge funds with running around with hundreds of millions of dollars moving faster than a community could get organized. So we've seen this play out in recent history. And here well, we I have think, this program. I think your yeah. point, too, uh, that, you know, um, we had uh, a group of people from Pittsburgh uh, grant from the Heinz Foundation. Um, we had uh, people from the Forbes Fund who do uh, capacity building for nonprofits and community-based nonprofits, and they basically said, "Look, this whole this whole sector is broken, and and um, and many of the small nonprofits that that typically would be funneled to this don't have leadership capacity, have not been trained to do this kind of stuff, don't actually understand the data side of things that Mark is talking about. How do we help them?" And how do we help for profits that are doing these interim use and and make sure that it's got local ownership? That that feels really important. And your point, Jesse, about diverse fund managers, come on, we've got to we've got to change the picture there. It feels like. Um, so this is this is something we're seeing across the country. And uh, Jesse, you said at one point you actually were working with some of the some of the other communities like like Pittsburgh and 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 other other areas. So you've seen this across the country. This is something hitting all over. It's nothing new. You 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 yeah. see it all over the country, in Atlanta, in Baltimore, in Pittsburgh, in Philadelphia, the same challenges are being felt all over the country. Um, it's time. It's time that creative strategies for financing get created so yeah. that you do have uh, developers that are interested in working with community groups, with local nonprofits, and build that capacity along the way as a key strategic partner. Um, uh, but it just doesn't happen. We have another question, Mark, coming in about the business model of the work you're doing. 
uh, from okay. pay. And I think that's important because I think people need to understand what the generative business model is since we're asking much more to be invested in this. We want to point out why this whole thing is generative and works. So uh, to our developer friends who are curious about what you do, what is the business model here? So the business model, what I guess, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of business. Are you models, a landlord? The, the, is it a fee for service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you own yeah, the yeah. businesses? What's the, how does this all come Yeah, so, so, so basically how it works is we'll come in and, and, and we take a holistic approach to like an entire neighborhood. So we're going to look to acquire a, a multitude of properties in a given area. Um, and then bring them through a variety of different processes um, from interim use to final build. And in that process, the incubation kind of just works um, in such a way that that we're essentially, essentially a landlord tenant, but with benefits um, in some instances. So in some instances we'll do um, like, you know, short term, low cost leases, but they'll, call, they'll be a percentage lease. So if they do well, we do well. Um, in other instances, we'll use a slightly different format um, where it's not technically a lease. It's a, it, it's a, it's, it looks like a lease, but it's, it's a license. Um, and that's really helpful for when we're providing turnkey spaces and maybe providing equipment within those turnkey spaces for people to use. Um, and the ultimate goal is that we're working on in kind of the back end of this is, is a platform for us to be able to use with our met methodology to, you know, share with other municipalities and other developers and folks, you know, not only in this country, but around the world, we've, we've worked with several uh, different municipalities on, on planning these kinds of things in their in their uh, communities um, and uh, you know building a system that that a lot of the pieces are already in place but such that you know our entrepreneurs can come into a turnkey space do their day-to-day -day activity and essentially um, have their rent utilities and all other costs of their business taken out on an incremental basis through the swipe of each credit card so if you think in the reverse uh, mechanisms like this exist with like the idea of square cash. So square cash will give you an inventory loan or something like that. And you don't pay it back just every swipe of the cu the card you get from a customer, a, a portion of it goes back to pay that that debt. Uh, so we do that similarly with, um, you know, our tenants based off of rent. So, you know, we like to have a lot of flexibility in our space such that like if we have a, you know, call it a food use space, you know, they would use the commissary kitchen in the back to do most of their prep work. And then the the storefront would essentially be used primarily for, for finished work and service. Um, and that could be changed as quickly as on, on a shift basis, right? So we could have different users in there um, morning, noon, and night, and then even after hours uh, based off of other, other things. It's about flexibility of space and flexibility in uh, the tenant landlord structure. So we don't take ownership in any of the businesses. Um, and without going too deep down this rabbit hole, there, there's a program that we um, you know are looking to, to really uh, make wider, which we call CARE, which stands for Community Activation Reinvestment Equity. And so what that looks like is as our-, our And our wider, you mean, wider you mean W-I-D-E-R, right? CARE basically, what that would do is that would allow our, um, our, our tenants or licensees, however you want to describe them, to a portion of, of, of their revenues would go to a, like what's called a pooled income fund that's held on behalf of, of the community as a social benefit. And those tenants would move out onto Main Street. And as they did that, as long as they kept their business within one census tract of that location, they would continue to keep that equity. And so when it's time to go to um, the ultimate uh, final build, we'll call it after the interim use, um, they can have a say so in whether or not that property gets sold, whether or not that project gets moved, um, and additionally, if they want to entitle it for something else, you know, like a good example and like the Logan Heights neighborhood might be that the neighborhood is, um, you know, a very Latino neighborhood and, and more often than not, uh, there's multi-generational housing. So maybe instead of building a bunch of ones and twos with a few threes as the apartments, um, maybe there's, you know, two threes and fours to, mm -hmm. to, to accurately serve the neighborhood. And they would have a say so in it because they would they have, have a voice in it and they have equity. Yeah. yeah. And then, if, and then if, we, if, if we decide not to develop it, we're deciding that, that together. And then when we sell it to that developer, they're getting a piece of that action as well. Yeah. And so it really encourages folks. You know, one of the questions I get about these neighborhoods a lot of times is like, you know, security must be a big issue. It's like, no, it's not. Because we work with the because the gang leaders, the drug dealers, in all yeah, the, they want to they're invested in it. Yeah, they bring yeah. their family there on the weekend, um, you know, and all this unrest and what have you that we've had recently with looting and things like that. Um, you know, outside of San Diego, we, we work uh, a lot in Atlanta as well. And the neighborhoods where we work saw no looting. 
Um, hmm. there, were, there was nobody who defaced any of the property on Logan Avenue. They were kind um, of protecting of it even, right? They were, they were protecting it because they, there's ownership. There's ownership yeah. in the neighborhood. There's no need for security cameras because the, the, the people in the neighborhood care about it because they own it. Um, and that's really what makes the difference. That big idea of almost, you know, making this more um, generative, grow bigger pie, instead of trying to fight over the pieces of a, of a diminishing pie, but it also feels like it's more circular, right? You're looking for how do you, how do you make this more of a circular economy rather than, uh, you know, importing from other parts of the world or and other Mickey, places you and, I both and, come and from not the, recycling. We both come pie. from the software yeah. world. And if you look at what's going on here, this is also about prototyping, about, you know, this, doing things quickly and learning and yeah. failing, uh, uh, testing, lots of, lo lots of testing, yeah. uh, right. The, the, uh, uh, and it's also that you know there's all of this concern that uh, that capitalism is extracted, which is another way of saying you, the ownership goes to the few people with a lot of money. So here you're actually working on how do the people who are part of that development own a piece of it? So it's not like the artist who comes yeah. into Soho or someplace and gets struck it out. So this is an example of a kind of a of a capitalist project with a bunch of interesting goals that begins to provide some insight into how to do things differently. Uh, which is pretty cool. I would like to bring in right now, uh, since we've just been describing how the tech industry, tech industry mechanisms to view urban development, this is a perfect time to bring in from San Francisco, ladies and gentlemen, a member of San Francisco's urban planning team, Robin Abad. And how do we pronounce your last name? Ocabillo. Ocabillo, Robin, thank you. Um, well, we've all worked together on some of the urban prototyping and market street prototyping projects. And uh, first, I'd love you to share with us a little bit about what this San Francisco planning is doing in this placemaking arena, uh, and also how we're using this COVID moment to, to update what we're doing. But first, you've seen some amazing things from uh, San Diego and kind of what's your perspective on this and how does San Francisco use some of these similar influences? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the case study in San Francisco is inspiring on many levels, right? I mean, um, principally because it's about investing in community and empowering folks in uh, in community economically, otherwise access to capital, access to space, access to legal, you know, um, and other technical assistance that can mean that those communities are thriving in place, right? And as you mentioned, Peter, um, there's a narrative around capitalism being extractive, um, but there are other ways that, you know, we can uh, create the mechanisms for everyone to participate and to thrive. And so, yeah, I mean, hats off to, to um, to my colleagues down in in uh, San Diego who are doing this work, I mean it's it's really really fantastic. Um, Here in San Francisco, there must be a lot of pressures right now with COVID, with small business. What 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 are, what are kind of some of the things that are on your mind that that are changing or that, that there's a response here? Absolutely. Well, it's about um, government and bureaucracy um, cutting red tape and getting out of the way, and so deploying, you know assimilating some of the, the processes that we see in, in, in tech and software development, right? To, to, to iterate and to just test, get, get really tactical about it. So, um, you know, last week, our mayor, Mayor London Breed announced the Shared Spaces Program, which is really looking at sidewalks and curbside lanes and, you know, in some, in some cases, entire streets as opportunities for restaurant owners, small business owners, cafes, other small locally owned retail to use that space for dining and retail merchandising activities to serve the neighborhoods and communities that they're located in. Um, because obviously within close quarters, you know, shopping and, and eating in these activities aren't, aren't permissible under the, you know, the, the current social distancing requirements. So, you know, we're reimagining the ways that we can use our public space assets or public realm um, in kind of radically different ways that, that we're not used to thinking about here in San Francisco. And, you know, it's, it's taken a kind of, it's unfortunately taken a global pandemic to really get us to start rebooting and rewiring some of our longstanding thinking about you know, how our public realm and our streets should be performing and delivering um, to our community. So, you know, the, we just started accepting applications this week. We hope to see wide adoption of this program by, you know, restaurants and retailers in the neighborhood commercial corridors all around the city where we're spinning up programs. What's the, what's the time frame? Like what, what might we look forward to where and when? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you, you we hope that within the next week, um, or so we can look in, in commercial corridors in all different neighborhoods of the city, all different demographics, all different communities, 
and see, you know, um, food establishments, you know, our, our, our taquerias and, um, you know, our, our uh, cafes and, you know, all of the, the businesses, the diversity of businesses that make up San Francisco's commercial corridors um, out in the street you know, resuming vending, resuming. Uh, tell me what the name of this was again. And, and if you're a local restaurateur or if you're local, you've got, you know, something, a, a small business owner, what, what would I look for if I were, if I were trying to figure this out and I want to get out to the streets and use the public spaces? So, you know, you, you would just want to look for opportunity to, you know, conduct, conduct your business and your activities. And so um, that's principally the sidewalk and what you know the curbside lane or the parking lane right mm -hmm. so putting tables and chairs maybe in addition to what you might have in your back patio or in your front of house um, so it's like these little micro parklets and kind of how can yeah. you get out and of course use the space because good airflow outside right. is That's a lot right. healthier you yeah. can social distance and you know what i'm really excited about here is um the the uh the possibilities that that this opens up for not only um restarting our economy right and getting people back into their jobs um mm -hmm. and and small business owners back up and running but um you know i think it's fair to say that through covid we all probably globally have a renewed appreciation for public space and and, and public life right that's something that's acutely mm -hmm. suffered we're all sequestered at home to one degree or another, not able to see our, our friends, be out in public, go to concerts, even just walk down the street, down a thriving street, um, you know, like in Mario Logan, I can imagine it's someplace I gotta I put on my list to come visit. But you, when you're out in the street, you don't, the vibrancy that once was there isn't there anymore, right? So, um, and what is that, what are the implications for us as, as a city, as city dwellers, or you know, indeed humanity, right? There are so called social and psychological impacts to that, you know, disconnectedness, loneliness, all of those things that um, that are resolved when we're all able to just be together with one another out, mm. out in public place. You know, what's what's lovely about this is when COVID hit, we're all like, people aren't going to be in cities; they're not going to go downtown. It sucks. In fact, operationally, what we're saying is, outside okay, crammed inside not so good. So now what we're solving for rather quickly is thriving outdoor street life, which actually is the thing we love. We love the West right. Village. We love North Beach. It mm. is difficult as hell to make mid-market be North Beach. But well, you kind of have this But I think there's another component, you know, and, and I think it goes to what Robin's saying. You know, there was a 10-year study in Chicago. Uh, I saw that it was uh, it was done by this amazing scientist, social scientist, where they just reintroduced green spaces to the parking lots of public schools. They just reintroduced the kids going outside to actually be around a tree. And over the course of 10 years, controlling for everything from demographic to the neighborhood, this is Chicago Public Schools, so you're talking 400,000 children, okay? Um, uh, they actually saw an increase in healthy outcomes. They saw an increase in test scores. They saw a decrease in diabetes. They saw a decrease. And it turns out that, that there's an emerging field of study called biophilic design patterns, mm -hmm. which are how our bodies actually react and relate, almost like the pheromones we get from trees. And from, you know, and as far as we know, the forest on earth is the, is the only forest in this galaxy. So we probably wanna pay attention to it. Like the, the outdoor land is more important than ever. You know, we probably don't wanna be cutting down all those old trees to make uh, cool urban buildings, um, you know the, the the new emergence of the of the sort of using timber for that stuff. We have to be really sensitive to this. But there's this massive biophilic design movement that is about how do you actually uh, take advantage of the fact that we co-evolved with nature over three billion years, right. and we got away from it. So, I, Robin, what do you what's like tomorrow look like for you? What are you focused on? immediately next like you're it's keeping you up at night or you're super excited about it oh man well i think it's um understanding how uh, what other programs and technical assistance we can build into you know shared spaces to ensure there's um there's wide adoption right because hmm. um you know obviously equity moving towards equality is 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 a value it's a, it's it's something in san francisco we're very very committed to so um we're our team is currently uh exploring a lot of different ways we might be able to do this, some technical assistance grants, um, partnering with local um, uh, NGOs who work either at the citywide level or maybe at the neighborhood level to communicate about the, um, the availability of the program, help you know small business owners access the tools, 
Um, we're also thinking about uh, scale. So, you know, uh, we've we've because bureaucracy can sometimes be hard. We've mm -hmm. been looking at a you know kind of the sidewalk and the and the curbside lane as that unit of operation. But really, you know, when when we think about scale, um, physical scale. Um, you get uh, a whole order of magnitude and, and economies of scale if we're maybe, you know, organizing uh, uh, business uh, operators in a, in, on, a, on a whole block, for example, to either maybe close the whole street or take over. Mm. Robin, is what you're describing uh, a permanent change or is this a, just a temporary COVID change? Or did we just lose you because of how the Internet works? Oh, hope we do. It's San Francisco. We've got at least 300 baud connections now. Uh, we'll I think we might have lost Robin. Um, uh, actually, you know, what might be interesting, what was your question, Jesse and Mark, just in terms of the discussion? Uh, let's get it out there so people can hear it. One of the things that I was going to ask uh, Robin um, is the importance of P4 partnerships. So people talk about P3 public private partnerships, but you know, one thing the Bay Area, hey, Robin's back. Um, Perfect. I wanted to ask you, Robin, because over the years as I've worked in, in San Francisco and in Oakland, the importance of forward thinking philanthropy has yeah. been huge. And so the public private philanthropic partnership for P4 strategies, not just P3, um, I would say what I love about the Bay Area, and 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 I I hope you agree. So I'm kind of asking you is is that there has been that forward thinking philanthropy to partner with uh, the public and private sector, and being able to work and um, galvanize the nonprofit community and lift those voices up. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're you're completely spot on there. You know, we've had both both um, you know local funders as well as national folks see the value and what can happen here in San Francisco. The Knight Foundation has been pretty huge um, in funding things like the um, the prototyping festival that Peter had mentioned earlier that um, was a partnership between SF Planning and the Yerba Buena, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Uh, so that has been, you know, there's a huge role that philanthropy has mm -hmm. and can continue to play um, and public-private partnership as well. You know, um, one example that I like to cite, um, maybe similar in some respects to the social conditions and uh, you know around Barrio Logan that had shifted, right? That had that had started to shift due in part to a lot of the the work that you um, both Jesse and Mark have been doing, um, is a neighborhood in the very center of San Francisco, Hayes Valley Market Octavia. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it was a neighborhood that had been decimated by a freeway that had been put in, right? You know, you talk about all of the all of the ills of of the past modes of urban planning. It's just like messed up urban form, illegible landscape. You know, running right through a, a low income neighborhood. And when we had our earthquake, um, many of our our freeways. Well, we've had many earthquakes, but a, an earthquake at the at, in the late eighties, um, mm -hmm. many of our freeways collapsed, and. Um, as a consequence, San Francisco lobbied to dismantle the freeway that had cut this neighborhood in, you know, cleft it in twain. Mm -hmm. And um, we assumed ownership of the parcels, the former freeway par parcels. And so here you had a neighborhood that was essentially a bombed out crater that had mm -hmm. been, you know, disinvested and ignored, um, you know, uh, and now there was this great opportunity to re-knit not only the city urban form and fabric together, but sort of socially, economically, you know. So there was a major partnership between the city of San Francisco to um, do sort of interim phase zero activation and experiments on those freeway parcels as they were being, you know, moving through their process of being RFP'd and um, put out for development for affordable housing. And so um, one really key example, which um, resembles um, in a lot of aesthetic sense, the, the co-place example in um, Barrio Logan here in San Francisco called Proxy. And this in fact is still operating, um, run by the folks over at Envelope Architecture and Design. Um, you know, uh, an architecture firm that figured out through a series of experimentation, right? There's that tactical urbanism again, how this physical place what programmatic and kind of um, other 
interventions, very, very surgical, very acupunctural at first, small moves could start to generate something larger in the neighborhood. So, you know, another great example of public-private partnership, the city couldn't have accomplished that on its own, I don't think. Um, and then here we found a partner in this case with a, with a design firm um, who really understood the potential. And so, um, and I just wanna plug, you know, too, coming from San Francisco, um, the, the critical leadership that, that designers play, urban designers, architects, landscape architects, industrial designers, um, and they historically have played in San Francisco in terms of really attacking and interrogating how our public realm can um, do more, you know, serve more people, be more comfortable, help move us all towards social integration. We have we have examples like Proxy, the Parklet program, which is, you know, a kind of part of your, our national vernacular now when you think about um, how, how, how we can retrofit cityscapes, right? Everybody does parklets. That's something that we're really proud got incubated here, um, largely as a result of our design community here in San Francisco, really seeing an opportunity um, and functioning um, as more than just designers, but really bringing design thinking to figure out how to um, engage community, how to Robin, it's build social capital in, in neighborhoods to create these installations. It's interesting to point out when we did Market Street prototyping, how broad a swath of the community got involved because we did an open call. We had students, we had ar recent architecture grads who could never have a public portfolio. We had software, hardware people. Uh, the, after we did it the first time, the SRO people came down and said, why can't we go do it? And so it, it really was a way to draw the community into what it was doing, uh, which is one of the exciting parts of it. Uh, a quick question for you. This, what you described earlier, the what, what the mayor and you're working on now for much more outdoor life for social distancing and stuff, is that a temporary thing? Or are we going to be changing our streetscapes in that direction permanently? You know, right now, the, the goal is economic recovery, right? Let's get the economic heart of the city pumping again, get our small businesses, you know, operating to you know, whatever, you know, as much scale as they can possibly achieve given all of the, the public health restrictions that are in place right now. Um, and so um, in California, we've the, our governors laid out, right, this four stage plan. We're sort of in stage two right now, which mm -hmm. is the opening up of retail and, and certain kind of gatherings. And right now, um, you know, we're thinking about sort of just in that phase. Um, but I think what the Shared Streets program and many other kind of tactical urbanism programs that preceded it, even pre-COVID, are helping us to do is imagine the potential of our public realm um, to do much more than it already does. Mm. You know, there's a high risk we could fall in love with this stuff. I, I, think our, I think we're already in love with it, right? Yeah. Anytime, we go to, anytime you go to Mexico City or you, yep. you, know, you go to Paris or you go to Rome or you go anywhere else in the world, there's such a vibrant, you go to San Diego, you, there's such a vibrant yeah. street life and, and an outdoor culture that, um, yeah, I think we're really excited to um, experience more and more in San Francisco. It's good for small businesses, yeah. you know, right? It's, it's good for the social resiliency and the neighborhood resiliency. Of, of our communities, which came up in the Barry Lee Logan example. So I'm very excited. In the 1960s, mm. when Thomas Hoving and Mayor Lindsay closed Central Park on Sundays, people were just screaming, right? And now you could not consider opening it. And you think of what uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Jeanette Sadie Khan went through when they put yeah. bicycles Cyclo in. Cycle yeah. Uh, yeah. Like Carroll Square and all of that stuff. Uh, nobody would go back. And so this is, oh, and the other one that's just like it, when the Bay Lights first came in here, <laughs> we had a launch meeting. Yeah. And I remember we had we had uh, Willie Brown and and Mayor Newsom and, and uh, Ed Lee there. And someone said, is this going to be permanent or temporary? And Willie Brown goes, oh, no, <laughs> it's temporary. We'd never think of keep doing this because they just wanted it to be below the radar at a prototype and yeah. don't worry Piloting about it. Piloting isn't a secret. Yeah, it's yeah. a secret sauce. Well, and, and uh, you know, I love, Robin, your call out to designers and architects. Obviously, I care about that a lot. And uh, part of Prototype Market Street, you know, we tried to support that at Autodesk with with our access to our Pier 9 that has like all the tools of the 20th and the 21st century for all the artists to come in and machine and make giant things and yeah. even help prototype the city lights and things like that. And I, yeah. I think that's the other part of this is how do we go pilot prototype, but with real humans actually put people first, which is that, you know, the design thinking kind of ideas. How, how do we make it human centered? 
Um, I know, Robin, you've got to go pretty soon. We were thinking uh, maybe you could comment a second on pro or, uh, on prototype market, and then we'll show that clip to kind of end uh, this this segment. Uh, any any comments you want to make about that uh, prototype market? Yeah, uh, the Market Street Prototyping Festival, yeah. which yeah, as I said, was a, a partnership between the YBCA and SF Planning Department, funded by the Knight Foundation, inspired by um, some some work done a few years earlier by um, by Gray Area, another incredible yeah. organization here in San Francisco. Um, you know, uh, I, I would just say that it, it it well, there's a lot of things that I could say about it, but it's a, it's really emblematic of the spectrum of experimentation that's happening. Um, that has happened and continues to happen here in San Francisco, both in terms of urban design and kind of like, you know, how we show up as, as institutions and public interest organizations and private sector in the public realm and how we use that and we, we engage other, other human, uh, human beings or help human beings engage with one another, right, on that very human level, um, building that social capital, connecting to a sense of citizenship, um, you know, a, a larger sense of the um, the body politic, if you will. Um, but there, it was. It's it's also emblematic of a lot of the experimentation that within the bureaucracy and within government, San Francisco has embraced. So, you know, I mentioned the Parklet program earlier. Um, we um, have an ordinance called Places for People, um, which was passed a few years ago. That is all about enabling this kind of community-driven, um, you know activity and stewardship and ownership of of place and so um you know that can be cutting red tape it can be streamlining bureaucracy so that business transactions for for external partners are really there's you know we're trying to eliminate as much friction as possible because we recognize that our nonprofit organizations our social you know service providers um art institutions cultural institutions they all want to be part of this solution and they all have an agenda to um, connect and connect us to one another that can be expressed in public space. So that's one really exciting thing, um, I think, about the, the work that the planning department and San Francisco leads kind of nationally is how do you formulate those connections and do that kind of ex experimentation, um, you know, so that we, we, we all just keep kind of moving in the same direction um, in terms of of oneness, which is so critical, you know, I think the, the events of this last couple of weeks has shown um, how important it is to to uh, to be connected to one another, right? And to, to have empathy, to have understanding, um, and to and and that happens in the venue of of public space. That happens. And we have a clip coming up, which you may miss because you have to leave us pretty quickly. I do. I do, and I just want to thank um, Jesse and Mark for sharing what you all are doing down in San Diego, and Nikki and Peter. Thank you for having Robin. Me. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, uh, Robin, we want to thank you. Also, two weeks from today, on June twenty-six, Quarantine will be coming to us live from the streets of San Francisco in one of these on-the-street restaurant places, which you'll help us select. So we want to move into the streetscape, right. into this experiment. So we'd love to both share with our viewers where it is and we'll come outside when we get the all clear to come outside and join you in our new streets. Let's do it. All, all right. right. Thank, Thank you. Robin. Robin. Wonderful weekend. Yeah. Bye, Robin. Thanks Robin. Um, well, well so let's, Robin, let's run that clip from let's uh, take a, Market Street prototyping. Go ahead. Let's run it. This is called Rock Around the Block. It's one of the uh, urban prototypes here. It, it forces you to look at uh, your partner or a member of the armed forces or whoever you happen to be with and enjoy the city a bit more. It's interesting because you are close enough that it's kind of intimate and that at the same time you uh, kind of communicate without saying anything just by like looking at each other and then like you know you're rocking and i'm rocking and we end up rocking together 
So each of these maps is the same location but tells a different story. Exactly. I think people feel very comfortable just walking up to it and playing with it and they find a spot that they are familiar with and then they are curious to kind of just move it around. None of us necessarily need to be here and talk about it for them to like get a lot out of it. So this is a storytelling booth. You're asked to record up to a 90 second story about a stranger that you once met. And then in return, you get to also hear someone else's story about a day that they have met. So it's a way to kind of connect our community through storytelling. Hear a story. OK, hey, hey um, what was in Montreal? Goal with Street Speak is to actually place it in the communities that we're talking about developing and allow them to kind of come forward with their stories when they feel comfortable sharing them. I should mention we ran Market Street prototyping twice, two years apart. And the predecessor for it was done with 5M, a smaller developer. And it started because 5N, which is owned by uh, Four Cities and Hearst, they had a four acre development site. And they were like, what's the right use of this site? And this was you know, kind of the earlier days of social media. And they realized putting an architect in a corner to come up with something might not be as useful as if we turn space into a wiki. And we had all sorts of uses and we could just learn from people. Okay, so the first time we did it, the toughest thing with the city, that would be architects and city planners. We're about as excited about us doing user-generated cities as journalists and brands were about blogging when it came out. Because it was like, if you're an architect- yeah, who, why, why would they do that? We know what we're doing. We're urban. Do not leave it yeah. to the people. Yeah, okay, but when, the, people. when this happened, uh, first of all, the toughest thing was to get all the permits pulled, right? Because we, we had to like get the city council to let us do all sorts of wacky stuff. It's like every street corner between Ferry Building and City Hall and Tenderloin. And you're going to go do something on every street? What, what are you doing? It permit yeah. that didn't exist, an electrical permit that didn't exist, an OSHA permit that didn't exist. We were there was building. No API, I think, between the city right. and the citizens. And when you're building that quickly, you put something up at like 11 in the morning and it doesn't work. So you rebuild it at 2. And th that happens at Burning Man all the yeah. time, but not, okay, so all of that had to get people cool. Hmm. What city people realized is, oh, this is a good idea. People do have ideas. And there was a social capital piece to this, which was uh, when we started asking people to participate, people really wanted to participate. This even went back earlier when people were building, we were opening the city's data and putting apps together. Everybody wanted, people love to contribute to their city. And so you have to give them, as you know, Mickey, and design a specific challenge, something to solve, organize them a certain way. And Autodesk was part of that. Okay. So then we then the whole city amazingly said, let's do this for all of Market Street. And we instrumented it. We measured a lot of stuff. And um, and this will eventually affect things. Well, uh, Mark and Jesse, you've seen, you, you've done an amazing job of doing kind of a, of, a, of a lean prototype mechanism for commerce. What we've just shared with you in San Francisco is more of a public realm mechanism. Right. I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on how these various ideas come together as America rebuilds herself for the better in the coming years. Well, I mean, I wanted to, to mention something uh, before Robin left, but before yeah. and it, it's the need for, you know, and Jesse mentioned it as well, is the need for, you know, either 3P, which is public-private partnership, or 4P, which is public-private um, philanthropic, philanthropic uh, partnership uh, to really get these kinds of projects moving. And I know, Peter, we didn't get a chance to talk about it much today, but our project in Courtyard is a great, uh, is a great example of that. I mean, that was a blighted city on block that, we used a placemaking ordinance to activate the space. We brought in shipping containers. It was quick. It was easy. It was fast. We took what was once the worst block in town, the most one of the most dangerous places to be, um, and shifted that neighborhood in just a couple of years. Um, and that only happened because the city of San Diego worked with us. Um, mm. And the second thing I would say is, is, is you know, I'm not. I haven't dealt uh, with San Francisco <coughs> specifically on on their placemaking ordinance, but. I encourage municipalities to really look into placemaking ordinance that allow for flexibility for projects like um, urban prototyping or 
um, any of these other kinds of projects, like our, even our projects, to, to actually get off the ground and be done because exactly what you said, Peter, is a huge challenge, right? With, with getting anything done, people have great ideas, but then the planning process can be a, a, a real challenge, right? To get these electrical permits and these other kind of permits with, you know, an overriding placemaking um, ordinance in place, you can make a very streamlined, very quick, very easy process. And we actually helped the city of San Diego draft theirs. Um, and, and now if you wanna do a placemaking activity in the city of San Diego, um, you know, essentially it's it's about as much work as if you wanted to go, you know, start a Christmas tree lot. So very, very limited effort, you know, very flexible um, as far as parking and other kinds of requirements. Um, and, you know, the placemaking ordinance, at least in San Diego, runs for five years and is, is easily extendable with just an email. So I encourage municipalities to bring that into the fray and, and do what they can with other, you know, people out there. And then lastly, I would say, you know, the private sector really needs to look at this as well because you can move projects along a whole lot faster. I mean, public-private partnerships and philanthropy are, are wonderful um, in their best case scenarios. But as Jesse kind of talked about, you know, fitting into a specific bucket and getting that capital to move quickly um, can be, sometimes be an arduous task, um, especially if you're talking about even state, local, and federal incentives in addition to that. If you're a private investor and you're doing placemaking activities on private land, you, you can sidestep a whole lot of bureaucracy um, and if those placemaking ordinances are in place, then you can move very quickly to a project through a project. And as an example of that, our, our 30th and commercial project that, you know, we showed a, a walkthrough of a little bit earlier, um, that project will will we'll take ownership of it in July, and and within six months we'll have the apartment units fully constructed and occupied. Um, wow. And that's a testament to the fact that that entire parcel there is actually falls under the space making the place making ordinance because it's meant to be only for five years. And because of the construction we're using, we can move it in five years. And, um, you know, we have done that successfully before, Mickey, I know you know that um, with our courtyard project is we've taken these projects, had them in a space for two, three years. Um, and then when it was time for the city to sell it at RFP or for a developer to build a, a large site, um, a, a large building, um, and then we picked it up, put it on trucks and moved it uh, to the next most blighted block in town and took the co entire community with us and, and started incubating a new part of town. A little bit like Here's a the... traveling circus of some sort, you know, in, in some ways. And I mean that in a positive way. It's just, you yeah. know, it's sort of how do you start gr building local capacity? Everyone's got a little something. We're putting on a show. Let's do it. And then be able to move it along. Um, I, and importantly, these I, things aren't expensive. That's what I want to bring to, like, also. Mention. Well, that's it's, it's I not think you're expensive. able to get this stuff when it's when the actual the property itself is probably really low value, but by bringing value to it and doing that data analysis you talked about, you're able to actually raise the value so that the people who have locally invested in it and a part of it can actually benefit from the Absolutely. the bounty later. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing you didn't mention though, uh, Mark, was when you actually left the spot you were on. It wasn't as if you just decided to move to another blighted block. You had about 40,000 residents in San Diego come out in support, wow. protest against the city to not shut down uh, no, the don't, park. Don't leave. Don't really? leave. So you ended up moving to another Yeah, that did happen. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Yeah. And the community. No, they the happened in a good way. They came back and said, "Safe courtyard," and, and they didn't realize that it was that it was a, a public-private partnership, and that you know we just Excellent. you know had a conversation with the city and moved it to another place and, and kept the 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 active the activation for the community. And you know, it's mm -hmm. great. You know, post COVID, I was just down there earlier this week. Things have changed a little bit. You got to get a reservation to go to the dog park now, but. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, we're open. I just, I just want drive throughs to come back. It seems like they're drive through festivals now, drive through graduations. I'm just a car guy, so I want to I, I want to get back to the low rider life. I, I like the sound of this. I got a 51 Studebaker. I want to make sure that we can oh, hop, through nice. the, hop through the town. That's what I'm looking for. I don't know. You know, we talk about all this. This sorry, Mickey, Mickey rant for a second. We talk about all these these streets and these. You know, we've got to have curb cuts and we got to have curbs. We got to have all this stuff. The parking. And, and there have been really fascinating studies of how um, how autonomous vehicles actually optimize. They don't actually drive to the outside of the outside of the city if they're not being used for ride share. They basically create um, uh, traffic jams a few blocks away because optimally for them, not humans, but for them, the algorithm says stay close for the next ride share. And and we're not thinking about like, wait a second, what if we just got rid of all these streets? What if we got rid of all these curbs? What if we actually planted more trees? What if we actually like started thinking about what new urbanism could look like? You know, and then sure, okay, we'll have a autonomous drone come pick us up if we've got a 
get to the hospital fast or something like that. But do we really need all these these things that we evolved for sort of the, you know, the ticky tacky houses that we put up in suburbia in the 50s or something like that? So so it just I just I, I wonder and it was kind of related to Robin's comment how permanent permanent is if we actually start to feel it, you know, because I was promised flying cars uh, when I was a kid and I was promised like like that we would actually have four day work weeks and we'd have equity. And uh, the last comment I want to make, and, and it relates to maybe Jesse's uh, comment about how do we actually create a different m model for fast deployment of capital and, and local ownership, local local ability, is we look at gross domestic product and, and gross domestic product mathematically, you can have a few billionaires and most people being poor and the gross domestic product goes up because of the way it's measured. And there's some interesting work coming out of um, old Peters and uh, Nicholas Taleb around non-ergotic, ergotic, I always get it wrong, economics. And it's called the, de the democratic domestic product. And that means everybody has to go up for the product yeah. to go up. That means that actually it all has to rise. And it's actually based more on reality. Uh, we don't live in, you know, uh, multiple parallel worlds where we can where we can play these games with economics. The gross domestic product measures nothing that we care about, you know, as, as Bobby right. Kennedy said. So how do we how do we start re refiguring the economic side of this as well? I think is 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 critical. One thing Peter mentioned uh, when you asked Peter about you know where else we've seen this, and hmm. when I was looking at the piece in San Francisco, and when I see what you know Co Place is doing here in San Diego, it takes me back to Wynwood in Miami. It takes hmm. me back to 16th Street in Denver. And so what a lot of people don't realize is the light rail system, getting that redeveloped in Denver um, from the airport to downtown. And Anina, Anina made a comment about, you know, America loves their cars. But, what, you know, what people don't realize is that those initiatives started heavily by nonprofits pushing for foundations to get behind a lot of these programs. And so in Miami, the Wynwood District started in essence by the Rockefeller Foundation. When Darren mm -hmm. Walker, who's now uh, president of the Ford Foundation, he was at Rockefeller and he gave a grant to the art center there in Wynwood. And now if you go to Wynwood, it's, it's, it is that walkable um, mm -hmm. community event space in the evening that has a lot of activities that many people did not think could happen in Miami. They thought, well, Miami doesn't have that urban vibe, um, graffiti, hip hop, urban vibe at that time. And it's grown into a place that is a, a place where the community comes together day and night. Sadly, not done so equitably. Um, you know, a lot of the small local artists have been displaced and a lot of the small businesses have been displaced. And in order to leave space there, it costs a lot of money. But one thing co-place, and I know you're not too happy about this, Mark, but one of the things about Co-Place that attracted me to them in particular was one of the local business owners and meeting the women business owners in the community. Mm -hmm. um, here, you're not going to like this, but when they told <laughs> me, yeah, that's so You're powerful. scaring me, Jesse. You're scaring me. <laughs> Just do it. Just do it. And, and, and they said, well, we've had some struggling times, you know, on and off, and they haven't raised our rent. They understand that we... We're in this together with them. And so that to me was 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 mind boggling. You know, here are these developers that are buying a property, but they really haven't, they're working with the tenants and in an equitable way to make sure that the community does succeed. Um, so there are equitable development strategies that are being implemented across the country. Um, it's about lifting those up and finding yeah. new ways of financing so that more people can participate in the economic opportunities in our community. And this, this uh, Jesse, does wait, before the... we go, last little, last little question. I feel I'm, I'm just like walking all over Peter today, and I don't mean to, but this is, I, I'm just super excited by this. Jesse, yeah. you said the four Ps, the P4 strategy, and I heard public, private, philanthropic, but I couldn't figure out what the four Partnership. Partnership. So when people say, oh, partnership. P3, okay. <laughs> when people say P3, they always say public, private partnerships, public, private. Uh, okay. And okay. so I'm sorry. I sometimes view philanthropy as its own little sector. You know, yeah. it's it's it, 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 it's it's quite it, it's public, it's private, it's non, it's it's in its own world sometimes. And so, yeah. when you're able to create that P4 strategy, um, mm -hmm. and have equitable development opportunities, um, I think it's a win-win solution. And if and we can get more foundation, 
think creative this conversation creative. is this hmm. notion of being able to experiment, do it lightweight, learn, have data, turn it around quickly. And that's the beauty of these hmm. kind of inner zones or these things that happen quickly. Um, Mark, I'd love to follow up with you. The, the, the legislation that got passed in San Diego that allowed this to happen, we did a similar thing in San Francisco after we did uh, Marcus reprototyping, we passed the living innovation zone rule that basically said, if you want to do these things, you can do it quickly with fewer regulations. Unfortunately, what happened was every department wanted to then get involved. The arts commission said, wait, that's art. And so a number of people stopped it. So sometimes when you, when you, hmm. when you make these things formal, uh, there's it's problems. Like you come up, people see you, you're like a sticking out it, nail it, that somebody it, wants by to By the way, out. I didn't say it was an easy process helping yes. San Diego And America has a long, we have a long tradition of, try, you know, trying these things and then learning from them. We had enterprise zones, which had their own economic development issues. Now we have opportunity zones and we're learning how to improve them. This is what we do mm. here. And there's another zone. There's the temporary autonomous zone, the TAS. Now, mm -hmm. this has come into the news recently because Seattle declared one recently. If you may recall, the, the people in Seattle took over a portion of the downtown and declared an autonomous zone. And the, the, I bring this up because the concept of the temporary autonomous zone has a San Francisco heritage. It was the anarchist philosopher Hakeem Bey who wrote about these autonomous zones. And one of the things he pointed out is in addition to people self-governing them, it gave you a sense of agency. If you relaxed the rules and felt you were in charge, you could get something done. You believed in yourself, even if it wasn't the right thing to do officially legally. And But this concept of you get to do it and believe in it is a very powerful self-actualizing thing. It's the founding principle of Burning Man, right? Which is uh, you get to go up there and you get to be Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses. You get to go build the thing and be responsible for it. And um but just for when one I week, was, and then we're going to light it on fire. But yeah, yes. that's the that's the kind of broad. <laughs> but it gives the community it gives the community power. Now, here's an interesting yes. point. In the middle, so I was at the White House working on uh, on some of our Maker City stuff, and I mm -hmm. chose not to bring up Burning Man because I just was too radical, even for the Obama White House. So I didn't bring it up, but I mentioned this concept of people's power when they get an autonomous zone. Or I didn't even say the word; I just mm -hmm. described it. Tom Khalil, the president's science advisor, came up to me and said, "You know." Peter, President Obama's strategy for cities is for neighbors to believe they own it, that they have a temporary autonomous zone. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's a Burning Man reference. Where did this come from? And he goes, you know, your president's a community organizer. But the concept oh. was, if you give people the belief that they own something, they'll do a great job. That brings us to the present day, to Seattle, because you may have been following the fact that the people in Seattle declared that they had taken over part of town as an autonomous zone. And my first reaction was, this is great. We did this. We've done this in San Francisco, San Diego. But then like, you turn they took on over city, like City Hall and police yeah. precincts or something. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened uh -huh. was, that's right. It, the, the cap, I think it's the Capitol Hill part of town. There was a pr police precinct. There were protests there. The police were fighting them. There were rubber bullets. And so the mayor got the police to essentially abandon the precinct. And the people around there declared it an autonomous zone. And if you turned on Fox News yesterday, or you were my friend Bill Cleary, you said America has capitulated. It's like Somalia. It's warlords. They're running around with rifles. Of course, President Trump came out and said, I'm going to send the troops in. We're, we will. I have an Air We've Force. We've lost gonna control. This we're going to recover. Like a part of and, America has just disappeared. Okay, so tanks, that's right? one narrative. Send them in the tanks. And, and then the other narrative is, well, actually, we're having a protest here. And the question is, what the devil is going on in Seattle? Fortunately... Mickey's son lives in Seattle, and we deputized him as our correspondent. And I and I talked to Zen the other day, yesterday. And I, said, uh, I told him he just needs to make a fake microphone that says, you know, what is news or something. Right. And then they'll yeah. think you're a, you're the press. That's what Peter does. Those are all well, fake. Here, hard, there's hard the hard quarantine microphone. So, yeah. <laughs> so yesterday, uh, Zen goes over to goes over there and for six hours shoots a bunch of footage comes home, and then today we're trying to figure out, let's figure out what really went on. Because as you know, on quarantine, we spent a lot of time on conspiracies, on news, on, on, on just how we, the narrative is such an important part of the story. Our whole last episode was that. So now what I'd like to do is turn to Seattle and find out in this most important zone, the autonomous zone, following in the great tradition of the opportunity zone and the living innovation zone, what's going on and what we can learn from it. So Amid, let's take ourselves to Seattle and this morning's report.
I'm speaking with Zen McManus. Zen, you are our chief Seattle correspondent and son of co-host Mickey McManus. <laughs> and and yesterday, uh, when we were getting reports that uh, a portion of Seattle was occupied, there were warlords and had seceded from the United States, there might be violence, uh, and there was a confrontation with the police, we were wondering, what's going on here? So we asked you to go over. Uh, can you tell us where you went and what you found? What was the scene? Yeah, so um, I drove over, parked not too far away, walked up, uh, walked to Cal Anderson Park, and it's a uh, large park in the middle of uh, Capitol Hill. There were just people, people hanging out, people hanging out in tents, um, young people, children, family, like really people about families. There's all sorts of demographics of folks um, all just hanging out and uh, generally playing on the soccer field. Uh, or playing games, playing music, and uh, there's areas for speaking. So there's a whole DJ slash sound system set up, and people are able to go up and uh, talk and talk about whatever issues they are seeing or what they're facing in their community. And it's kind of just like an open forum. And then there's other more organized uh, opportunities where they do different rallies and do different chants, and they give uh, time for again, more speakers from either it's Black Lives Matter or anyone that has a story to share so that people can listen. You're describing a cross between a street fair, you know, where there's porta parties and art and a protest where people talk. Um, there have been, there were reports of armed people, um, unknown armed warlord type people. Right, right. And so um, I read an article about that. I did not meet that man, but um, there was, I think, a local rapper who was, was walking around with the microphone and um, an AR-15 or something like that. The was there any security because, going on? Were the police providing security, or did did wasn't security needed just because like it was people sitting in a park? Right, and that's the the whole idea is that there was no cops. That's the the critical point, and the people that are providing security are providing security at their at the streets so that people can't just drive in and um, do anything because they they had a recent incident where a person drove a car through the barricade and shot someone. So uh, they've reinforced it so people can't just do that. And the idea is that it's a cop-free zone. So they can police themselves. And I think generally everyone has. There's no destruction of property. There's no uh, extortion that I have seen. Um, and there's no checking people's licenses or IDs and making it a checkpoint kind of zone that somehow is outside of the United States. And, and did it look like there were organizers or people in charge? How, how, how did it manage its governance? Yeah, that that is the, the part that I think is still very up in the air. Um, it it felt like a lot of different entities of different people doing different things, and they're just more there to be supportive of a Black Lives Matter. But um, but then, kind of, how do you want to see Seattle's local city government take shape? So some people are very much against the mayor. Um, they have a booth set up to petition her res her resignation. I think other people are looking to more of the defunding police. And then others are looking at how you help rebuild the community and make this a central place to, to do, to reinvest in, in different ways. There seemed to be a tiff yesterday between the mayor and the police chief. The police chief got on television and said, I was forced to surrender this territory. And then the mayor said, cut it out, people have in the park. So can you tell us anything about what's going on in Seattle on that matter? And I think that there's a there's a there's a bit of a divide there on the political side and the, the police side. Um, obviously, I don't think anyone in the police want to give up a precinct <laughs> that looks bad. Um, but in lieu of uh, continuously gassing and uh, shooting rubber bullets and shooting flashbangs and doing all those things to people who are actually just peaceful, who are now just sitting and hanging out and creating new things and trying to generate new ideas. Um, I don't think it was helping the conversation. I don't think, I think the next steps are what we're figuring out because this is a whole new chart, uncharted territory kind of thing where- The next steps being a set of demands about, or conversation about the city, about policing, about rent. It really right. is a, you know, a, right. a set of, of, of left demands confronting a probably a more moderate mayor and a little less moderate police chief. And the question is, what does the city do next? Right. Right, and how to hear them out, right? And I and I think that was they're they're trying to have these meetings, and I think that there's a bit of chaos with that because 
everyone wants to be represented. But everyone's ideas are very wildly different and who they are and what they are about. Um, I think they are still trying to grapple with that. I don't think there's a clear leader of anything. So um, it's more of, I think, a statement that this could even happen in the city. That's what people get worried about. <clears throat> And the fact that Seattle is opening itself to that, that that conversation, I think, is what carries other people. So this is either, uh, as Trump might put it, losing a city and we have a problem, or this is a great expression of democracy and pluralism, the Overton window open, people imagining what to build in America next and understanding they have the agency to have that conversation because they're self-governing people. I would hope that would be the latter, right? <laughs> We're adults, and we can figure things yeah, out. No, it's not, it, it, this sounds like this sounds like the messy business of running a city. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how long were you there yesterday? Uh, I was there from seven until eleven. Yeah. And were they wearing masks? Were they socially distant? Everyone was wearing masks uh, for the most part. Some people don't, but they that, that was it's, it is your choice. But people are giving. It was a mask culture. People. Yeah. But everyone's very cognizant of that, and they're aware of it. And there's free hand sanitizer, there's masks. Like I said, there's medical people everywhere wandering around. Um, anyone that needed anything could probably ask and find it. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate your getting to the bottom of this. Look, I feel like this is a very healthy act of democracy. People got together, expressed their opinions, did it nonviolently, got ideas on the table. This sounds kind of like what you're supposed to do. And it looks like Seattle's doing it slightly better than the federal government right now. Trying. I think they're trying. And I think that's a, it's not a bad model. If you want to engage with other people who, who have not been able to engage with, give them a space. Give them a space to talk and get them out. Zen, we will get back to you. Thanks for uh, holding down the fort in Seattle for quarantine and uh, have a good day. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks. Right. Bye bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Well, that from our correspondent and your son in Seattle. Yeah. I think I promised him I would never make him do something like that. But yeah, um, you know, what's interesting is he he also shot a whole bunch of footage uh, and you and Omid edited some of that in there. There was actually a, a piece of footage that was that was someone giving a, a speech about the first thing you they will do is kill. And it was a young uh, African-American woman who had a huge crowd around her. And she was saying the first thing they will do is kill the artists, kill anybody who remembers what the culture is and who reflects what the culture is so that you don't know who you are. So you lose your identity. And uh, I feel like we could, we could, uh, we could probably have a, a bunch more uh, clips and insights into this uh, experiment that's happening. Um, you know, I, I of course worry because he's my son, I worry about his life. Uh, but he, um, he has family members who are native American. And he also mentioned that, uh, you know, that is a serious issue in Seattle, in the, in the Northwest especially, but across the country. And they're feeling like they're getting heard a little bit more. Um, and and he's saying, you know, and, and of course he has family members, uh, his mom and others who are African-American and Native American and a bunch of other things. And, and he has heard many of the sides of this, uh, along with his cousin being a police officer in Chicago. And she's, she's struggled with things. So I think when you look at the picture, this is America. And uh, a big part of what he said at the very end there was we've got to learn how to just listen and, and, and be good followers, not have to feel that we can solve this, but actually listen and give other people voices. And, and I think that's the, the ultimate point to a lot of this is let's actually try to do something better. This is about forming a more perfect union. And that means it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> uh, it's beta. We got to work on it. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think the other interesting thing about this was, well, first of all, this completely hits this narrative of civic discourse the use of public space, the stuff that Robin was talking about, the stuff we talked about, all of it. And and uh, boy, it's amazing how easy it is to spin that into... Um, We've lost a part uh, of America, yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm heartened by, you know, Mark, you mentioned it, uh, that the uh, community in, in San Diego, the community in, in Atlanta was actually protecting it because they're part of it. They, they want to hold it. I think, um, frankly, Killer Mark, Killer Mike's 
uh, speech, that first night of the riots was breathtaking and beautiful. And, uh, you know, and I think, I think we need to be looking for who are the people now talking and give them a voice and look for ways that, that it's not just um, sensationalism or, you know, trapping eyeballs the way somebody like a Facebook might do it, but let's not train the or algorithms to help us overthrow ourselves in November. Let's actually help the local people who are leading and doing things lead and do. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's why I love Jesse being on and Mark and everyone who's just out there doing things. Um, so I, I appreciate you all being here. Any any reactions to the Seattle stuff, Jesse or, or Mark? No, wow, it was interesting. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I love it when people in community can come together and, you know, try to create change. Um, mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess my, my only commentary on it would just be to say uh, it's a good experiment to see. You know, um, I think that there's, you know, a lot of times uh, the media sensationalizes things. And then sometimes when you get a closer look at what's on the ground, um, it's a lot different story. Uh, and in addition, there's, you know, the time is never better to be exploring new ways of doing anything. I mean, the world's literally been turned upside down in a, a very, very short period of time. And it's not like we're just going to flip right back to where we are. So now is the time to really reimagine and to have these kind of conversations and, and hear different voices. And, and hopefully we come out of all of this with a lot more equality and equity in, in the decisions that we make in cities and, and within our communities. Yeah. Uh, Mick, you may want to um, a preview for us our two next week's shows, because we're going to continue on this city's theme, on this rebuilding theme uh, for a while now. I think someone's at my door. I hear a dog. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, next week we're going to be running in nine different cities. We're going to be running something um, called Audacities with Nicole Bradford, who's going to guest on our show. We're just helping out, uh, Peter and I. Um, but it's about kind of how do we shift from smart cities to cities that help people thrive? How do we go from top down, you know, we're going to sell smart technology like, like Cisco routers and IBM servers and stuff, and, and, and the city leaders know all the answers, to more bottom up. How do we go from big brother to little sister? How do we go from not believing that we understand uh, how to solve it and just trying to look for proof to prove our theories, but actually listening and, and weaving together people places, potential, um, the arts and the sciences and, and the minds, both the algorithmic minds and the human minds, the silicon cognition that's starting to permeate our lives as well as the organic cognition like us, um, together to find meaning. And so we'll be uh, probably bringing some segments to next show's episode. We've got Michael Ford, who's the hip hop architect. And uh, he's been working with people like um, uh, Lupe Fiasco and other hip hop and blues and Motown artists to basically say that um, if you if you're an architect, he's an architect. If you're an architect, um, you do a post occupancy evaluation, a survey of how your occupants enjoy or don't the thing you built. And what he's finding is that hip hop, blues, Motown, just listen to the lyrics. They have been reporting a post occupancy survey for the last 50 years about how these backdrops that we call buildings and places and spaces are basically a, a, a theater set to have this horrible play performed that is unjust. Wow. And he's really interested in building a entire next generation, an army of hip hop architects. So he's been running um, workshops for high school kids. And it turns out that only 2% of American architects are African-American men, and only 0.2% are black women. Whoa. So, you know, Churchill famously said, we, we build our buildings and we shape our buildings and then they shape us. What are we doing? And so he's been running things with many of these hip hop artists who actually ha are, have been reporters at the front line of what's happening in our cities, and then actually decoding the lyrics and then building physical spaces based on the lyrics. And having the kids work in, you know, Tinkercad and Legos and and learning how to make and actually helping them see that they could shape the future. And so he's got something coming up in August and we're hoping to report a little bit on it next week and have him him join uh, both the Audacity's worldwide uh, experiment we're running as well as join Quarantine 
to share a little bit, um, probably with Lupe and a few other amazing artists. I, I'd love to, to, to be introduced to him. Uh, we did a... Uh, the you should join next week, yeah. The, the Encore <laughs> development in Tampa um, was the old Central Park Village, and it was an African-American mm. community, mm. an Afro-Cuban community from the late 1800s to the early 1900s where the mm. history of music was so huge and it was a black business district. And mm. so, you know, but urban renewal came in, destroyed everything. And so when we developed that 28.8 acre mass development site, you know, we brought in the African-American architects. That we wanted to lift the, the, the history of the neighborhood so much so that the main, the main road is Ray Charles Boulevard, which is where Ray mm. Charles recorded his first album. One of the buildings is named the Ella after Ella Fitzgerald. And, you know, wow. so, wow. yeah, I would love to meet him because I think that there's. Yeah, well, actually, this, this Sunday, uh, there's going to be a New York Times article about Michael, uh, about him planning to build a hip hop army, a hip hop architecture army. Um, and, uh, and Jesse, for sure, let's just um, let's set up some time to talk and have you join or have you participate and learn about it. I think it's some amazing stuff, and I think we need to look for ways of giving them energy. Um, I want to thank all of you. Uh, this has been an inspiring end to a couple of very traumatic weeks in America, or an end to our show. Uh, a week ago on on Wednesday after the George Floyd uh, murder, we had a uh, we, we we did a show looking at kind of the history of civil rights through the eyes of the media and through rhetoric. We came back um, last week and, and, and revisited that. And, uh, you know, today we've come and, and we've talked about many forms of speech. Uh, we've talked about what's going on in Seattle, hip hop as an example of it, and, and the public square. And I think the interesting thing here is that there's been a lot of question this week about is what's going on American or anti-American? Um, you know, where do we fit? And I think that's one of the reasons that we had uh, Zen go to Seattle to report on what's going on. Um, I come out of this couple of weeks incredibly hopeful because um, it, it just looks like when there's problems, America knows how to get to business. And I'll tell you the, the image that came in my mind when I was listening to Zen last night, and then I was hearing all these people on the right saying how anti-American it was. This is the image. I mean, if we could take a look at that, this is the image that, that actually came to mind. This is from Norman Rockwell, his Four Freedoms series in 1943. In the middle of the war, President Roosevelt proclaims the four freedoms, freedom from want, from fear, from worship, and freedom of speech. And Rockwell paints them in the Saturday Evening Post. And this is, of course, a community meeting in Vermont, people expressing their opinions, saying what they want, and figuring out at the most local level how to proceed. That appears to be what was going on in Seattle this week even if what people were saying was unpleasant to some. And that seems like a most American of instincts. And uh, as is this instinct of using public and private and philanthropy and partnership to get on with the business of, of making what's next. So that's kind of what we care about here at Quarantine, whose name is getting a little long in the tooth, but here we are. And I want to thank you, Mark and Jesse and Mickey, and we will be back here on Wednesday uh, for two deep dives, Wednesday and Friday on cities. And we will continue this conversation because um, uh, the future is where we will live the rest of our lives. Thanks. It is 554 Pacific Quarantine. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks oh, very our, much for having us. Our, our long show only went till for two hours. That's not bad. <laughs> It's quarantine. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jesse. See you. Have a great Bye. weekend. Good night. Thanks for having us. Bye bye. Let's get close, but not so close. Quarantine. You can share from a distance. Quarantine. You know we want to see each other. We'll have to stay in your corner. Time space while we draw. <laughs> 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 <laughs>